So I was told this morning that the enrollment has reached 46, and there are 45 people or 45 chairs in this room. Um, here is number 46, if anyone can bother when necessary. But all I want to say is get comfortable. It may be that in the next five minutes a few more people turn up, and we'll probably have to use every chair you have, and possibly that one there also. We'll see.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad you all managed to find this room here. As you can see, we are trying out one of the SJTU multimedia rooms, and we'll see how this works out. It's a little bit crowded. Let's see how how the number enrollment numbers work out. If necessary, uh, we might need to move to another room if we get too many people wanting to take this course. We'll see. I'll wait a moment. Um, good. So, welcome to our course which is called Methods of Applied Mathematics, Part 2. And this is always a very strange type of title for a course. Usually, if you do this to graduate courses if you want to have a course where the instructor can talk about whatever they want. Basically, Methods of Applied Mathematics can mean anything. It could be anything from complex analysis to group theory or whatever. And in our case, therefore, um, there's a subtitle, Green's Functions for Partial Differential Equations. So that's going to be our topic um, this semester. It's a graduate course, and, but it is open to undergraduate students. As far as I could tell on Canvas, about half of the enrollment is from undergraduate students, the other half from graduate students. So that's great. I hope you'll be able to have some little bit of intercultural exchange and discussions also um, and share your different perspectives. But because it is a graduate course also, I'll say something about this in a moment, um, there are no clear prerequisites listed, because usually the prerequisites simply say, well, graduate standing, you're a graduate student, which basically means one assumes you know everything and you've never forgotten a single formula that you ever saw as an undergraduate student, which is, of course, also complete nonsense. So I'll say a few more things about this in a moment regarding what you should be uh, more or less aware of and things perhaps that you might want to review. Anyway, <clears throat> I've uploaded a syllabus, which I like to call a course description onto Canvas. So you should be able, you should hopefully all be enrolled in the, on the Canvas site. And there in the file section, you will find a syllabus. Um, it's I think something like 10 pages long or something. Still, please try to at least skim through it and read those parts that seem relevant to you in a little bit more detail. Um, I have an office in the JI building on the fourth floor, room 441C. Um, there should be office hours on Canvas, and I'll try to see if I can add anything else in terms of, um, say, an online office hour or something similar later on. But if you want to contact me, just uh, shoot me an email, forst at sjtu.edu.cn, short and easy to remember. Now, um, we have a teaching assistant. So, Lushan, would you like to come here and say a few words? And he will be able to help with grading and... Uh, the name here is wrong. Wow, it's not very embarrassing, sorry. I have the wrong name here. Okay. So, obviously, um, you can see Leo Lushan. Your name is even on the screen. Can you perhaps say something about yourself? Uh, well, uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be the teaching assistant of BB557. And I think, among all the courses I have attended, this course has helped me the most. And I hope you will enjoy any great semester filled with knowledge and, uh, well, just enjoy it. Well, filled with knowledge and more knowledge, probably. Okay, anyway, thank you very much, Yushan. So, um, yeah. Um, there will be office hours also, and uh, most importantly, as I'll mention in a moment, there will be also piazza. There is piazza. But before we do this, just a small comment. Um, there is, as you can see here, some integration with Zoom. And I actually do mean a Zoom here. And uh, originally intentioned for um, international students to be able to take the course. It should still also work for everyone else as well. So if you want, you can probably also uh, join via Zoom. Um, I don't really want to require everyone to actually be in the classroom if you if you are busy with other things, but at the same time, if you are here, I guess the experience is a little bit better than if you are just joining via video link. Okay, um, so we'll have, oh yeah, before I go to the coursework, I should say something here. Also, I don't know, let's talk about the coursework. So as a graduate course, um, there are a few things here which are perhaps a bit special. Um, on the one hand, there will be homework, so weekly coursework, but you will be put into assignment groups of three students each, so you can submit one piece of homework or every week um, the homework together. 
Um, the homework score does not affect the course grade at all, but you have to get 60% of the points. Right? So that means you have to really actually do something, but you don't have to worry whether you get 60% or 100%, it all doesn't matter, as long as you get at least 60%. The reason is that homework is for practice and for discussion, and you should be learning something while you're doing it, but it's not really intended in from at least here in this course, as a method of evaluating. Okay. Um, you, should, um, you should please be familiar with the honor code policy, and that is also written out in great detail in the syllabus. If you are a graduate student and fairly new to JI, I strongly recommend that you have a look at the honor code part of the syllabus. Um, you should also be familiar with LaTeX, especially as a graduate student, when you type your theses or you type all kinds of things, very often, not always, but very often it is best to type it using LaTeX, and therefore I would like you to actually do, um, to actually submit your homework as a typed LaTeX manuscript. That will make life a lot easier for grading, and it will give you a good chance to learn a little bit of this um, nice and very useful software. Personally, having seen that there are all kinds of online services like Overleaf, for example, I strongly recommend that someone in your assignment group actually installs LaTeX on their computer locally. The online services are, in my experience, not really very good, but that's up to you. So I do have office hours. It's not quite sure that I say here instead of office hours, but still. Um, I strongly recommend that you post questions about anything you are interested in in this course, any, que any issues that are with the contents or anything else on Piazza. Piazza is like a very nice forum that allows me to answer in great detail if you have very complicated questions and everyone can see answers, etc. It's all very nice and useful. And so please use Piazza. Please don't post anonymously. It's better if just if you just ask a question normally. And sign up for Piazza, please, here on this link. Or using Canvas, click on the Piazza tab. There is a Piazza tab on Canvas, and then you are automatically um, logged in, basically. All right, so please do sign up for this course. It's very useful for all kinds of questions. Much better, by the way, than office hours, to be honest. I still do have office hours in case you have uh, personal questions to discuss or things where you feel face-to-face -face talking is much is better, but if it is just a question about, hey, I don't understand what you're doing on the slide or so, then Piazza is better for that sort of thing. Okay, so regarding the um, the grading policy, this is also put out in the um, course uh, description. There is going to be a term project. The term project will account for 15% of the grade. There will be a midterm exam and a final exam, and five points are left for attendance and participation and so on. Right? So I'd like you to join either by Zoom, I'll publish the Zoom links for this room later, or um, in the classroom. Okay. Um, from the point of view of grading, the grading policy is very, uh, is fa I think, fairly straightforward and easy. The top students, no matter how many marks they get, will get an A+, plus, and after that I will just um, set grading levels at more or less evenly spaced percentages. In a graduate course like this one here, it is always a little bit tricky because I find that the, um, the distribution is sometimes very, very strange. But still, I try to follow this policy, and I have so far always managed to do so. So for example, if there, is 100 po if there are 100 points in the course in total, and I find that, um, say, 90 points or 85 points is a level which, like, somewhere between 6 and 12 percent of the students have gotten, then that's going to be my A-plus level. And then I'm going to go down in five percentage point steps all the way down to whatever, 35, 40, 45, something like that, for until I hit the D level, basically. Right? So effectively what this means is that the only thing that really counts is how much work you put in and how much you understand all, all of the material. It doesn't matter how many people get good scores. Right? I'm happy with everyone getting an A. Nothing would make me more happy than that. Right? I basically just calibrate the top end of the scale and then go down in even steps. Okay. Um, before I go to the literature, does anyone have any questions so far? 
Feel free to ask me in the next class. Take some time to study the syllabus carefully, and then on Wednesday or so you can ask me and see if there's anything else that, that needs to be that that is unclear. Okay. Um, regarding books, we are fairly lucky in that all of the books that are needed are available for free. They are also all listed in the course description, so you don't need to uh, you don't need to take a picture of the slide here. Um, the first one I mentioned here is not really needed for our course. It's sometimes useful to review a few things about partial differential equations, um, but in reality we won't need it very much. And even in my experience for review, you won't need it very much for review either because mostly the required things you should know are things like linear algebra, for example, what is a matrix, what is a linear map in general, what is a vector space. That's going to be necessary and useful. And also a little bit of calculus, such as um, what is a surface, a two-dimensional surface in R3? What is a normal vector to that surface? How do you calculate a normal vector? How do you calculate the surface integral? Right? If you remember, there are two types, a scalar and a vectorial surface integral in R3. How do you calculate a volume integral? Basically, multivariable calculus. And the other thing you need is some knowledge of ordinary differential equations. And not a lot, but enough to know that many homogeneous constant coefficient ordinary differential equations can be solved by making an exponential ansatz, for example. Right? So let me put this on the blackboard. There are three areas where I basically say these are more or less prerequisites, what you need to know. And number one would be variable calculus. Number two would be some elements of linear algebra. And number three would be a knowledge of of ordinary differential equations. Basically the undergraduate students will recognize this. Any of our standard undergraduate calculus sequences will be more than enough to do this, right? You don't need a lot of linear algebra. You don't need very many abstract things, but at least you need to know what a linear map is, for example. And multivariable calculus, refer to any textbook that you took or for any course that you took in the second semester when you were studying that or third semester, possibly, depending. And um, if necessary, just look up what you need to look up, right? You're, if you have a surface in R3, you, or an R, yes, a two-dimensional surface in R3, you need to know how did you calculate a surface integral, right? Those are the things you easily forget. Theorem of Gauss, theorem of Stokes, that sort of thing. And those will appear later on in our course. Okay. Is that clear enough for everyone? Please don't hesitate to ask questions on Piazza if you feel you are missing prerequisites or if you feel that there is uh, material in the slides where you don't really know um, how to do it. I want to say that obviously I expect that from the graduate students, many of you are coming from many different universities. You've had all kinds of different undergraduate experiences. Of course, there is no unified curriculum. So please, is, there is no shame in saying, hey, I never took a linear algebra course, so I don't know what a vector space is or what a linear map is, or I don't know what, um, what a basis is. But um, so basically, in that case, just post on Piazza, and you will get explanations as much as possible. Right? Um, I cannot repeat all of this. It's a graduate course, so I cannot just simply say, okay, I'm going to just go through and review lots and lots and lots of prior knowledge on how to calculate integrals. I'm happy to do that mm -hmm. if there's a specific situation where you say, hey, wait, I don't know how this calculation works. Then I really don't mind spending 20 minutes on the blackboard to just explain something. Very happy to do that. But I can't just do it for everything without anyone asking. So the really important thing is, I guess, if you are sitting here, and you somehow don't understand something on the slides, definitely please interrupt me and ask me immediately, hey, uh, what is going on there? The probability is actually quite high that if you have a question, there are probably five other people with the same question in the room. Right? So don't feel shy about asking questions also during class. Um, 
This is a small classroom. We have uh, not a large enrollment. It's very easy to have a conversation go on, right? So please don't make me just talk, 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 even if you don't understand anything, right? So therefore, feel free to interrupt and ask. Okay, so I mentioned the book on PDEs up here, an introduction to partial differential equations, mainly in case you want to look up a few things. It's also something that's useful to read through um, just to get a broader knowledge of, uh, of differential equations. Um, the next book is the main book that we'll be using by Stackold and then his assistant Holst. Green's functions and boundary value problems will be going through quite a few sections in that book, but definitely not all of it. It's a really a graduate level textbook for engineering graduate students. Same for Tsaurara. Um Also PDEs um, in, um, of applied mathematics. We'll be using that in the last third, perhaps in the last three weeks or so of our course. And right at the very end, by Ang, a book on the boundary element methods. Where to find them? Look at the uh, look at our web page on Canvas, and look at the um, the course syllabus. Right. So there you have links for downloading all of these books, and all of them are available for free. Okay. Um, I should mention both Stackgold and Sauda are actually pretty old books. Old meaning they were first written in the 1970s or something. So if you see a book which is in its second or third edition after like 40 years of publishing, that usually means it's a serious book. It's not one of those undergraduate American style textbooks where you are in the 12th edition after five years of publishing. Well, I exaggerate, but you know what I mean. Not those that have a new edition every year just to generate some sales because they have reordered their exercises or something. But these are usually serious books by serious people for serious students. And um, that's definitely true of these two. Okay. Now, our course is split into three basic parts. Or, sorry, here I've, I've split it up into two basic parts, excuse me. The first one is about lots of words that don't make any sense at the moment, distributions, differential equations, fundamental solutions. I don't want to go through the whole list here, just a few highlights. We will look at things that are called distributions. That has nothing to do with probability distributions, right? So it's not in any way a probability theory thing. Another word for a distribution here is that a generalized function. And the idea is to give meaning to the concept of a point charge or a point mass or a surface charge, or a surface mass, or similar types of objects where you have a physical quantity concentrated in an impossibly small moment, or a small um, location. Think of this. If you are doing physics, you learn in the very first physics course, oh yes, Newton, Newtonian mechanics, we have point masses, our point masses move around and we calculate acceleration and so on and so on. Mass times acceleration for the force, etc. And But what is really a point mass? A point mass is simply if all of the mass, say one kilogram, concentrated at a point. But that would mean at this point the density would have to be infinite. How would that work? And how would the density be if you don't have one kilogram there, but two kilograms? It's nice to talk about that. You could always say, oh, well, yes, I replace it by a ball with, the same, with a certain radius and so on. But in physics, then, what do you do if these two point masses come close to each other? You cannot completely avoid dealing with point masses. But then when you write out the mass density, the mass density is zero outside that point and infinity at that point. So it doesn't, so it's very hard to describe mathematically. But these sorts of things occur all the time. For example, if, uh, let me take this here, if I drop something, it's going to fall and it's going to bounce. Another point situation is the instant in time where something that I drop or throw against a wall changes its velocity because there is an impact. The impact exists for an infinitely small and arbitrarily small amount of time. 
You can try and get around this and say, you know what, I'm going to take a high-speed camera, and even if I take a steel ball and shoot a steel ball against a steel wall, I can see some small deformation so that actually it is not instantaneous. So you can say that, yes. But is it any good for modeling? Probably not. If you want to really model, for example, how a tennis ball behaves when the tennis ball hits the floor and bounces back up, then you are going to assume it happens instantaneously. All of the deformation stuff, etc., is just going to ruin your whole calculations because it will make it way too complicated. So here you have not a point mass or a point charge, but a point instant in time where something happens. And these things should somehow still follow Newton's laws. That means if you say force is mass times acceleration and you want to calculate the force that uh, is exerted on, say, your cell phone when your cell phone drops down and instantaneously the acceleration is arrested by the floor, you need to be able to plug that into Newton's laws. Right? And so one thing we'll be discussing is how can we deal with this sort of thing where we have point situations in undergraduate physics, perhaps you've called, called these things delta functions, which are not functions at all. And um, how can we find a calculus where this works? An example of this is also the following. Perhaps you have seen this in undergraduate studies at some point. If you have a string, just an ordinary piece of string perhaps, then it can oscillate and it is described by the wave equation, right? So you have a wave equation that describes how the string behaves and how does it work? Well. Suppose here you have x, here you have u, then you have a function u of x, comma t, that describes the displacement as a function of space and of time, right? If you have a one-dimensional string, perhaps. Then, how does the wave equation look? It looks like this here, d2u dx squared minus d2u t squared is equal to f of x comma t, where this here is some external force, right? Have most of you seen this before somehow? Refer to a physics textbook, usually. Okay. So now you might ask, okay, what happens if my string is not time dependent, it's not moving? I want an equilibrium solution. For example, say I have a string and it is just not doing anything. I'm on the space station, I can ignore gravity, and so the string will just not move. In that case, if you want that your u of x comma t is actually u of x, the one looking for a time independent solution, you can immediately see this will only ever work if your force is also not time dependent, right? Because otherwise you'll be in trouble. In that case, this will be zero. We'll analyze this closely in a moment in our introduction. Then you have something like d2u dx squared is equal to f of x, right? Come to something like this here. So that tells you how the string will be displaced. Now, again, let us look at an example. Say we have a string. Say the string is fixed here and here. Right? And now suppose our function f is some sort of weight distribution, right? And then, for example, we could do the following. We could have a situation like this here, where we have a mass m, a block of stone, that is lying, a brick perhaps, balanced on our string. Then, as experience tells you, if the ends have been fixed like this here, then the string, which is actually, let me add a color here, hanging like this here, this will be our string, this yellow part. 
And you can also see, oh, wow, strange things are happening here because here and here we have a corner, right? And according to this, well, how can we say that this is a solution? Because here we are differentiating u twice with respect to x, right? We still have our x-axis, but here we have a corner. Everyone knows the situation where, and perhaps in a, more ex in a more clear visual example, if you have a necklace and you hang something on your necklace, at some point you have this weight, right, on your necklace, and then your string will actually look like this here. In some sense, you want to say, whatever is hanging here is a point mass hanging just at this single point. And in some sense, this here, which has a corner and represents a function that is not differentiable, should still solve this equation. And if you want, usually um, you would say, oh, on the right-hand side, let us put something like this here, perhaps, just to quote some undergraduate textbooks, and pretend that this weird delta is somehow a function, and then somehow this is a solution. So that's mostly what the beginning of the first part is about. How do we make sense of these weird point situations where we can't apply the usual calculus because we want to have a function that is not differentiable still be a solution to a differential equation. And we want to be able to model situations where either in time or in space or in any other quantity we have a sort of infinite density case. Right, where we cannot have a normal density to, just to describe whatever we're trying to talk about. Okay, and as part of the discussion, we find not only that, this, um, that we can describe the situation, but that we actually get more out of it. Because once we know how these solutions behave to these things, we can use them to solve quite general problems not just situations that involve all these point charges, but we can use them to solve situations which are not necessarily involving this, but where we can paste together these individual solutions, which are called Green's functions. And that's basically what our course is mainly about. We'll introduce here also the Fourier transform. We'll look at, um, again, other types of distributions, and we'll try to apply or see how the Fourier transform can be applied to all kinds of weird objects. Um, perhaps you are familiar with the Fourier transform from some undergraduate courses, and then perhaps you have also seen some weird situations where you have a function which is not even integrable, like, say, a sine wave, and you still take a Fourier transform of that sine wave, even though the integral should not exist. Again, that is one of those things that we discuss here on how to get around this. We also review a little bit at the end initial value problems for ODEs. That's where the prerequisite of ODEs comes in. You should, before we go to that, you should have reviewed a little bit about ordinary differential equations. Okay, and then in the second part, we apply this entire batch of knowledge to actually solving boundary value problems. First for ordinary differential equations, then for partial differential equations. For ordinary differential equations, boundary value problems are something like you have here, where you do not set an initial value. You just say, oh yeah, we have a fixed point here and a fixed point there. Right? For a second order ODE like this one here, instead of saying u of x is equal or u of x zero is equal to this value and u prime of x zero is equal to this value. That would be an initial value problem. Instead of that, you say u of x0 is this, and u of x1 is that. And then you try to find a solution. You can also be more general, of course. You could say u of x0 is this, and u prime of x1 is that. There are lots of physical interpretations that we'll get to later where these things um, are relevant. But of course, as soon as you deal with partial differential equations, that's where it becomes really important because there you have several variables. You do not have an initial point anymore. You have a domain in Rn, and therefore you will always say, okay, what happens on the boundary of this domain? Right? So let us get back as an example to this wave equation up there. You have u as a function of x and t. Say you want to describe a string of a certain length, let us say length L, then you could say, hmm, 
we have the x-axis, we have the t-axis, say between 0 and L. We want to look at u as a function of x and t. I'm not drawing the third dimension, the u values at the moment. I'm just looking at the x and t domain, right? Then you would say, okay. This is then the boundary of your domain in the xt plane, meaning that at t equals 0, the string is described by a function u on this x-axis. Let me clarify this perhaps. This sort of picture looks at the domain of what you could draw as follows in three dimensions, where you would say, aha, uh -huh. here we have L. At t equals 0, perhaps, the string looks like this. At t equals t1, the string has some other shape. And then what you get is a surface. And every cut through the surface represents, at a fixed time t, the displacement of the string. Right? But I'm not interested in this whole thing at the moment. I just want to look at this domain here in the xt plane. And then it is clear that at t equals 0, you don't have a single initial value anymore, but you have the complete initial displacement of the string. How does the string start out? Right? Is it taut or is it wavy or whatever? And then you basically have boundaries that correspond to these three parts of an unbounded domain. Right? So now you don't really have an initial value problem anymore. You really have a boundary value problem where you don't have, like for an ODE, just two points which are the boundary, but you have this whole thing which is the boundary, these three yellow lines here. Right? And then you need to specify what's going on. Right? For example, you could specify that if you have a string, that one side of the string just behave, or, uh, is fixed, and the other one just goes up and down periodically. Then you would be, in, then you would be in, um, imposing one boundary condition here and another boundary condition there, and you'd have as a third boundary the initial condition here. Right? So boundary value problems are inevitable when you deal with partial differential equations. Right? You cannot talk about real initial value problems anymore. So, and we'll see how to use these point solutions, these Green's functions, to solve these. And that will, that will get us basically here to this section here. And then the, the next two parts are about trying to find these uh, point solutions. And the last section is about, well, a numerical method called the boundary element method for solving PDEs, which is based on this. Um, if you are a graduate student, sooner or later, also perhaps as an undergraduate student, you'll be exposed to something called the finite element method, which is a very popular way of trying to calculate stuff numerically. And if you ever wonder what it does, it is effectively it solves differential equations numerically. That's it. It just uses certain things to solve these differential equations. Next to the finite element method, a slightly more, slightly different approach leads to the boundary element method. But basically it is the same thing. We try to solve differential equations in some way, and that may then allows us to model physical situations. Okay, so this is roughly, in short, what this course is about. Of course I want to go into a bit more detail. So, here is a proper introduction, which also will include some of the themes I've mentioned here on the blackboard. But before we start, does anyone have any questions? Are you curious about anything, or is there anything unclear with regard to the syllabus or anything? OK, well, if not, you can always think about it in the break as well. Now, let's look at a very simple physical system. 
Let's take the heat equation in a cylinder. So our cylinder is supposed to look like this here. Wait a moment, I'm going to get rid of this light here. I somehow suspect it is the rooftop. Ah, yes. Right, this should be much better. So, suppose we have a cylinder with an insulated mantle. That means the cylinder as pictured here, can be modeled as follows. We have an interval AB that tells us the length of the cylinder. We are interested in deriving the heat equation for the cylinder, and um, we are going to assume through the mantle, no heat can pass in or out, right? Otherwise, it's a cylinder that can be thin or thick, not important. And we want to describe the temperature inside the cylinder. Now. We can assume our temperature depends on x and t only. Here x is our axis along the center of the cylinder. That basically at any slice that we take here, the temperature will be the same in the entire slice. Why can we assume this? Well, we can't immediately say it must be like this, but if this, if this is true at some instant in time, for example, if we have initially at time t equals zero, that in every slice the, cell, the temperature is the same, then because the mantle is insulated, it will stay that way. Right? So all we need to do is assume that in the initial conditions, the temperature only depends on x. Then later on, for all times, it will continue to do so. Of course, it doesn't have to be that way in general. We're just making an assumption in order to construct a simple model. OK, so we'll assume that this is the case. Then we'll look at the heat density. The heat density is denoted by capital H. Um, and it is related to the temperature by the so-called heat capacity. The specific heat capacity is heat capacity per mass unit. And then multiplying with the density, just the mass density, we get that rho times c times theta gives us the heat. So that's basic physics, effectively. Um, don't ask me very much about this at the moment. If you are wondering where this comes from, consult a thermodynamics textbook or so. That will explain it more clearly. So we'll look at the total heat, which would be the integral from A to B of this heat along our cylinder axis, right? And as you can see, we're looking at the heat at the point X, meaning that includes the entire heat of the entire slice of the cylinder through the point X. Now, how can heat possibly change? We are going to model this in two ways. On the one hand, we could have that there are heat sources. That means inside the cylinder, there are points which create heat or destroy heat. So heat sources or things. And so heat created at time t is denoted by Q of t. Or heat can leave or enter the cylinder. But in that case here, there, there are only two options. Our mantle is insulated, no heat can go through there, but the faces, the two sides of the cylinder, they are not. And so we have a heat flux that will be counted in the x or, or well, will be counted in the positive x direction as follows. Namely, the heat flux denoted by capital B is going to be proportional to the gradient of the temperature. And that's called Fourier's law of heat conduction because Fourier observed that heat flows from hot places to cold places, right? If you put something cold next to something hot, the cold part will get warmer and the hot part will get cooler. And we have a minus here because the heat flows from hot to cold, not from cold to hot. Right, so the minus sign is important, and the proportion um, constant k in here is a heat conduction coefficient. Basically, that tells us, well, how easily the heat flows, right? So this is our model, and we are counting this b to be positive in the positive x direction, so that when we look at the heat change between time t and time t plus delta t, 
we have the total heat at time t plus delta t and the total heat at time t we take a look at the difference between these two things that has to be accounted for as follows we take the heat flux at the point a flowing into the cylinder at the time t but we have to integrate because we're looking at t and t plus delta t we have to integrate this from t to t plus delta t right and so for reasons of mathematical styling we give this t here another name we just call it tau and integrate d tau and now at the same time heat can flow into our uh, cylinder at b but we have to give this a minus sign because of the way we orient everything let me show you here we have a heat flowing in this direction flows into the cylinder heat flowing in this direction flows out of the cylinder at b right so if we count the heat that flows in we have to take minus b here that will flow into the cylinder there and b will flow into the cylinder there is that clear okay Plus, of course, as mentioned, it could be that in, within the cylinder we are creating uh, heat, and so therefore we have to integrate over all these heat sources, so we also add this factor Q of tau. We have three different terms, because all of these terms are found by integrating from T to T plus delta T. We just put them all together into a single integral. Okay. Now, we want to get a local equation from this. So what we do is we divide by delta T, and once we have 1 over delta t here, here and also there, and also there, we add this term there, then we let delta t go to 0. So what's going to happen? Let us suppose that our functions are nice and smooth. That's easiest. I don't want to run into any technical difficulties here. Then, on the left-hand side, of course, what we get is the following. So on the left-hand side, what we would have is, if we write this out, the integral from a to b, then we have 1 over delta t, and then we have here h of x comma t plus delta t minus h of x comma t. Oh, and here perhaps, yes, all of this is integrated dx, right? That's the left-hand side term. Now we let delta t go to 0. And we suppose, let us take the limit into the integral. If h is smooth enough and nice enough, we can justify that. What happens when delta t goes to 0? This becomes a derivative, right? That's just the formula for the partial derivative with respect to t. So we get this dh by dt here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, well, here we have an integral from t to t plus delta t. We divide by delta t and let delta t go to 0. That's something we have to treat separately. Let me write this out more nicely. Suppose I just have this sort of interval. What's going to happen if delta t goes to 0? What will, hap what will happen with the integral? Speak up. Any ideas? You can mumble a bit more, a bit more loudly, if you like. It'll go to 0, right? Because we're integrating over a smaller and smaller domain, of course. So. We can also divide by delta t. Delta t goes to 0. This goes to 0. Perhaps we have a chance of getting something finite. right? So the trick to calculate this is the following. We simply define capital F of t to be the integral from 0 to t 
of f of s ds. Then this here is 1 over delta t. And now here we could write this as follows. This would be the integral f of t plus delta t minus f of t, because this would be the integral from 0 to t plus delta t minus the integral from 0 to t. Right? And now it is obvious what happens here when delta t goes to 0, because what happens is that we get the derivative f prime of t. But by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we immediately see what is the derivative. It's just f of t. Right? So we see that when delta t goes to 0, this here goes to f of t. And exactly that is what happens here on the right-hand side. Okay. We are due for, our bre for a break. I think the way this is set up is we should have roughly a 10-minute break, not 20 minutes, 10 minutes only, I guess, and then we continue for 45 minutes. Is that right? Yep. And then we have another 10-minute break, and then we continue another 45 minutes, and then we stop at 3.30. I'm a bit sorry about this. That was the timing that was put together a year ago for reasons that had to do with me having to run over to Shanghuan for the next course. The reasons don't exist anymore, but somehow the time just got carried forward by the graduate office, and I didn't correct it in time. I didn't see that they had just kept this weird timing. Anyway, so 10-minute break, and then we'll continue with our teaching then. Thank you. 